So hello, good morning. Um, we wanted to welcome all of you on our joint webinar hosted today by uh, Antavo and uh, PwC, during which we would like to cover um, all of the topics related to the upcoming changes and the new roles, uh, which are the loyalty platforms and customer engagement platforms are going to play in the, um, in the role of modern retail. So first of all, um, a very warm, warm welcome to all of you who, who wanted to see what, what our thoughts and our, the results of our research are in terms of uh, the future of the loyalty programs, the customer engagement, which in practice means one of the most efficient ways of bringing the customers back to the store and how to win with the proper retention activation, which we all understand was crucial during last months, but it's becoming even more crucial and even more important uh, within uh, within upcoming uh, within upcoming future. Um, all right, and I believe the most important part here would be so to let you know who of us would be speaking and what kind of content would be presenting. So I'll be moving to the next slide with um, our portfolio. Uh, myself, my name is Maciej Kroenka. I'm a partner at PwC. I'm responsible for the revenue management practice. So topics covering uh, loyalty, customer activation, pricing, promotions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so overall, everything which is working on the top line it, with the strong emphasis on for offline and um, online retailers. And good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Adam Lushetsky. Uh, I work within uh, the strategy and operations team uh, at PwC, uh, specializing uh, in the retail and consumer sector. And my area of expertise uh, and specialty is everything that uh, is associated with uh, designing uh, retail formats. Uh, so how, how we should be optimizing our stores and what are the types of innovations that we want to uh, we want to introduce into into the stores and how we want to overlay the physical uh, uh, retail space with with the digital hi and uh, i'm jan rogler i uh, work as the vp of strategy and insight at antavo um, i've got 20 years background in loyalty and retention marketing both from a consulting um, side but also working uh, at businesses responsible for customer loyalty um, at Antavo, um, I'm working as the VP of strategy, which means I look into um, the market trends, but also loyalty data from our own programs um, to understand what will be winning strategies for, for loyalty program design. Um, Antavo is a leading loyalty software as a service platform. Um, we're servicing more than 50 clients globally, um, mainly in retail. and. Um, we also have some uh, product uh, offerings related about delivering the customer experience on the front end, so uh, loyalty experience kiosk for in-store uh, and some mobile wallet and, and app solutions. So, basing on the all composition of the people presenting today, uh, what we would like to achieve is the nice combination of all of the customer activation and loyalization uh, platform starting from strategy for design tactics down to the um, technological angle of the uh, of the solution simply because we believe it's extremely important to cover the process um, end to end because that's the most effective way to uh, make the reality happen all right and uh, starting uh, with the short introduction what we are observing on the market and what we see what's happening as we call it as the dust settles um, the implement the introduction of the new normal but it's not only the new normal in terms of um, what we see in the press articles and declarations but there's also a lot of already changed habits or drastically changing habits um, from the uh, from the side of our customers and uh, as the introduction we want to cover that and the, the what we think is the most important drivers is that the key trend is the switch from impulse purchasing to planned purchasing. Why? Because there's less window shopping. There's less shopping occasions. People are rather planning any type of purchasing that they, that they do. 
which is leading to one thing which is quite unfortunate for a number of retailers that's decrease of number of um, of shopping um, occasions so less chances to get a traffic the bigger importance to fight for um, conversion additionally as we see as the uh, uncertainty is spreading we are observing the strong impact of the trend from moving from experimentation to necessity in short words it means that people who used to have way more of uh, the income for for spending are now getting more price sensitive are rather more evaluating uh, at the moment when any shopping has to occur so again both with the combination of the planning um, the shopping missions and increased price sensitivity it's making the customer attraction and the activation a little bit more difficult than it um, that it used to be and at the same time uh, what we're seeing from the perspective of of uh, how customers uh, behave uh, in terms of what types of products at which channels they buy uh, we see something that's quite natural in the uh, in the times of, of social distancing, something that we call from social to individual, and this is this is uh, strongly linked with the types of products uh, and categories uh, uh, that consumers are purchasing. So a great example is that uh, is is uh, sports retail, and what we're seeing is, for example, a shift from team sports. Uh, to performance sports, so everything that was purchased uh, as a as a mean as a support for social occasions is now heavily heavily uh, uh, decreasing and and facing significant issues, and everything that's associated with uh, with personal with personal consumption uh, is 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 gaining in traction, and at the same time. Something that's pretty obvious, something something that we're seeing, uh, something that we're seeing universally. Uh, across uh, across uh, channels is shift from from offline to online uh, due to fear, due to social distancing, due to the quarantine, and of course, as this settles and as uh, customers return to stores, the question will be, of course, how many of those customers who really tried the new channel, tried uh, online, will will stick with it, and this kind of shift in channels will become will become a new habit for them. Yeah. Well, working on the, um, the shift from impulse to plant purchasing and the, the increasing role of price sensitivity, what we are observing a number of retailers, but we wanted to bring to your attention one particular example that we just faced in, in recent days. Uh, we see that a multi-brand fashion retailer, they observed a significant sales drop in the mainstream brands and more premium brands, but at the same time, there was a quite important shift of uh, the items which were put in the basket and a very strong increase in the overall sales that they were observing in the um, economy banners, which strongly suggests that there, there's a very good need to precisely understand what kind of products, which customers uh, will be looking for uh, as a means of starting any discussion on the, um, on the customer attraction and activation. And moving new, um, uh, to, the, to the, some more examples and challenges and threats that we're observing, uh, the press is covering a lot of cases when there's a new inflow of customers and then there's a lot of coverage telling that the online, any type of online sales are the pure uh, winners of the situation. However, what we're observing that a lot of that customers who are nowadays switching and are now op appearing in either other formats, banners or channels, they're, we call them ad hoc customers or nomadic customers. They come once, they create a lot of strain on the, um, on the operations and service quality, call it delivery windows in the terms if there's own fulfillment or uh, limitation of stock. But on the other hand, that's having quite negative impact on the loyal customers um, in terms of if they are not getting their delivery windows, if they cannot get their the, the preferred products, that's heavily influencing the customer experience. And that's uh, simply causing 
that there are at least two areas of action for, for them. The first one is, of, of course, the retention of the new customers and new clients. And if you're good in customer experience, if you know how to make them stick and try to develop new habits, they will stay with you. And of course, they would uh, um, they would become valuable to customers. But there's also a huge pressure um, to satisfy the loyals and limit the uh, the risk of churn, which is then um, having tremendous impact on the future growth. Because still, the loyals and the ones who've been with the brand for quite a longer time, they are the ones who are the solid fundament of the growth. Yeah, um, let me second that. Uh, from the Antabo perspective, we're seeing very similar things at, at our clients. Just you know, another example on the strain on operations. We're working with a uh, online drinks retailer, and they just from the increased traffic they have, their order packing times, so picking the right beverage, putting it in the box, has actually increased from one to five days over this uh, inflow. So it's really a strain on on all customers, and especially their loyal ones. But um, I'd actually like to add that those brands and those businesses that are faced with these new challenges are still the lucky ones because what we all associate with the headlines that we see in the newspapers are those brands who had a real, real threat because they've lost a lot of their clients. Their stores were closed you know, by, by, by order uh, often or by necessity. Um, and or they weren't really present in the channels that have been picking up. Um, we are working with a retailer in Slovenia. They were in the fortunate situation to triple their e-commerce revenue in, during the lockdown period. But unfortunately, e-commerce only represents 6% of their business. So they were still looking at an overall drop of 80% in, in top line revenue. Um, so we're all aware of that. What we shouldn't forget as well, though, is um, those customers that are staying, I've changed their shopping habits as well. So we do see a threat to top line revenue from reduced basket size. Um, as uh, Maciek said before, a, a shift from premium brands to more economy brands is playing a part in that, uh, a, a shift from or a shift to necessity purchases. So what's really, really important now for these customers, for these brands, is to bring people back, bring people back into the store. Because those ad hoc nomadic lines popping up in some retailers are the old and previous customers of those retailers who had to shut down their channels. So they need to make sure that they bring these customers back before they stick somewhere else. So it's all about bringing customers and it's all about driving the top line first and foremost here. All right, and then um, moving forward, the, the situation is, as we observe it, uh, there is the increase in the expensive channels which are aiming the um, customer acquisition so as many brands are moving to new channels to new ways of marketing the rates that you have to pay and the rates for farmers that you have to pay they are of the itl media what we also observe is that the number of they are uh increasing their promotional strategies and increasing their promotional policies. Why? Because for years they've been like a drug. Uh, they worked the way that uh, we invest a little bit. Mass context extremely uh, valuable and uh, extremely heavy on cost way of acquiring that, uh, that customers. So what we see and how we call this whole concept, the increasing spend to get more customers, the customers being more reluctant to visiting the stores and increasing the um, costs of uh, customer acquisition. That's a concept which we um, call a war on traffic. And whenever we're facing any of that situation and we're believing that the type of ammunition, call it communication, reach uh, the marketing spend, but also the promotional investments are becoming expensive. So what we wanted to present to you today is the way how to make sure that we're using that to the best potential benefit and that we're, while we're in the war, we're not shooting blanks. Yes, and... Um... Yeah, uh, to you, Jorn. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. 
Um, yes, and and actually, this picture that Munchik just presented of this really heavy focus on, you know, discount financial incentives. This is where we want to introduce loyalty as a or loyalty solutions as an opportunity to differentiate. Because you can also you can try to participate in that war by just you know throwing discounts and financial incentives at people. But there is actually a way that a loyalty program, well designed and well executed, can help you overcome and stand out in that in that competitive environment that it is today. And the first quite obvious point: loyalty incentives are generally actually less expensive than the standard straight up discounts. Um, so for one, you have the, per, the point that the perceived value exceeds the actual costs. Um, you know, you can give discounts on certain items uh, on a loyalty program that you can really tailor towards those, those product lines where you have higher margins, for example. People associating points um, to a financial value often forget that they're not going to redeem all those points. Points often expire, so they're not actually being put into place. And very important, the redemption of these loyalty incentives is date. So it only happens at the next purchase. So you get two checkouts, um, plus you, um, you have the later impact of the discounts. So that gives you two financial benefits, which all are really important. And then the final is it actually also helps you save money on new client acquisition. We're going to get into that a little later. But the brand effects, the engagement that customers have with you in the loyalty program, that creates additional um, reach, additional awareness that drives customer acquisition. Now, the second thing why you should differentiate with a loyalty program is beyond discounts that are very transactional, like buy once more, we actually can influence customers' behavior in the long term. Because driving engagement improves brand uh, metrics and improves brand recognition and improves kind of natural selection of your brand. You will always or more likely be in the top two or top three selection when customers have a purchasing decision to make. You can influence that custom behavior that way. And that drives traffic, and it drives often organic traffic. You don't even have to run campaigns to your loyal customers. They will naturally come if they have a need in the category that you're in, which then also means you don't have to really conduct these very expensive customer win-back campaigns because there are fewer customers leaving. You have changed their customer behavior for the long run, so you can really save a lot of budget on that win-back stuff. Um, and then the final, and that's the least um, direct impact of a loyalty program, it will really help you with your customer understanding, with your customer insight. You will build much better profiles, which means you can run very targeted, very relevant, and very personalized activities. Um, that means this goes well beyond the loyalty program. This is not the loyalty communication only that will get better. The data that you're collecting feeds back into all of the marketing activities that you are executing. And all of that will be more targeted, more relevant, um, and just more with a better response, with a better conversion rate. Yes, and, and from a commercial perspective, this is this is incredibly important in current times when we're seeing uh, increased financial strain uh, within within uh, retailers and FMCG players. So, so introducing a loyalty program or introducing a loyalty-driven solution really has a great and, and measurable effect on on uh, your spend effectiveness. Uh, so getting getting uh, higher ROIs not only as you had mentioned in uh, campaigns dedicated to to the members of your loyalty solution, but also to all other customers because of better gate, the data gathering uh, and and higher higher effectiveness of your of your activities. And also from the perspective of delayed redemption, uh, it's 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 uh, once once you you increase the number of your members. It has a, a, a significant imp impact on your cash flow. So, for example, returns uh, don't need to be processed uh, just like you would you would process them uh, to any any generic customer. Within the loyalty program, you can process them uh, a delay in a in a delayed form or in a in a form of points. Yes, so moving forward with that, what, what we wanted to spend some time with you today and uh, what, what we believe is, is crucial is to understand how to activate and how to use the loyalty ecosystem to really attract, activate and engage the customers. 
So for this purpose, uh, we wanted to have a closer look at the customer lifecycle. So from the moment of recruitment, where the objective is to build awareness, make a call for action, but also build the reach and advocacy. So having the program as simple and as explainable, even by the, 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 the most simple um, store uh, employee. Then through conversion, where when the key purpose is to drive the urgency, ignite the engagement and make people stick. So make actually use it, not only a word. So it's the desire um, that has to be developed. Then engagement with development of habits, because we need people to use the solution and use the platform and come to your store a couple of times to really get the habit developed. Afterwards, through activation, where we are fighting for the share of wallet by typically increasing the frequency, but also working on the uh, size of the basket, with modern days actually mostly calling for increase in, in frequency. And then to the optional step, but also very crucial from the purpose, uh, from the perspective of financial performance, is the, the win back, simply for customers to re-enroll, to reinstall, to defend your, um, your, uh, your customers. And for all of that objectives and stages, there are different tactics that can be used. Of course, they are not on, they are not limited to the very specific stage of the life cycle can be mixed and blended. However, there is um, a set which is rather linked to uh, all uh, key elements. So when we're talking about recruitment, of course, there's a dedicated promo, uh, meaning simply if you want to join, there's something special waiting for you. There's not only the long-term benefit, but you get something, something instant. Using the employees as ambassadors, not only in store, not only in communication channels, but actually making them aware of what the program is about, making the program explainable and making them see the value as we've seen a number of programs which actually were failing. Why? Because the people asked in store what the program is all about and then the uh, employees were not able to explain or were saying that it's not driving actually enough value. So it's all about incentivizing and building the advocacy in store, but also in, in, in social media. When we look at tactics in the conversion, again, that's a extremely important point on instant rewarding. So something you subscribed, you made your first purchase, there's something extra coming. Uh, the ramp up curve for the rewards, it should be rather easy, which means that the first any type of privileges or rewards the customer should be able to get them rather through the second and let's say fifth um, shopping um, shopping occasion because that's creating uh, the, the the need to 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 play with the with the with the program. That's the self gamification which is already starting, and of course any type of limiting the promotion saying it's a limited access or something that you achieve only if you stretch your behavior. So for example, visit us more often, buy something extra or invite a person and then you get something special. All the promotions which are based or the activities which are based on fear on, um, on missing out. In terms of engagement, of course, that's the moment where we already start to see the customer profiles. We know what they like, we know how they behave because we have a history. So the targeted offerings, they come, they come in place. We know what you like, so either we recommend something that you like or something that you might like, um, because other um, people were interested in that, or we see that it's of similar taste or um, organizational um, habit. Self gamification, so introduction of competition. This works like charm typically. Saying customers making little bets. I bet that you cannot come to us more often. We were working with that type of things while working with the quick service restaurants, and the challenge is saying. Let's make a bet. Can you, you're visiting us three times per week. Can you visit four times per week? And then you get an extra reward. That just worked like um, uh, like charm. Uh, more of targeted content in terms of inspiration. Bundles, next best offering. But overall, what is also becoming crucial for the stage of engagement is all of the measures which are related to customer experience. So no queuing, a little bit better service, some, some extra in terms of how you're treated and fun factors. If you look at the most successful programs, what they deliver is fun. It's a little bit 
games. It's a little bit features. It's it's a little bit of things which are actually making the customer smile. Uh, quite a good case study is uh, a short games in the app QSR, where you are waiting for your order to be uh, to be prepared. Uh, the key stage of activation when we work on the share of wallet. Again, that's a personalization, but it has to be a little bit deeper in terms we know your habits that well. So let's say if you're a grocer, we know that you're buying butter every two weeks and it's been already three weeks that you didn't buy it. So why won't you remind you of that? Any type of accessories, any type of changing seasons, any cha type of novelty. So anything that is linked to very good understanding but also in the inspiration and guidance. So um, what we see at this moment, especially when the window shopping is heavily limited and the number of points where uh, contact points where, where people are getting the inspiration, the targeted inspiration, guidance, any type of support, frequently linked with, with social sharing, that's one of the core things which are actually driving the traffic. Why? Because we give them a reason because we justify, because we inspire and tell them, yes, that's the thing that you would be actually uh, needing. In terms of WinBag, the typical most functional um, areas of work, of course, the communication and support expiry. Use your points, use your privilege, because if you don't do something that would expire, you would lose it and it's not worth it. Offering additional benefits if we see somebody who's been highly valuable. And again, uh, inspirations, but frequently linking when once in a lifetime occasion, especially if we can understand what is the reason of the customer potentially turning, if he's switching to competition or if he just moved to another place and is not um, and is not uh, living nearby anymore, which again we can observe by the history, by the geo history of any type of uh, um, the um, customer shopping. Adam Yorin. Very happy to have your comments on that because I believe that's one of the most crucial points for today. I would just add add one thing before before also uh, letting Jorn say a couple of words from his perspective. From our perspective, what's important, and we'll elaborate on that in a second, is that many of those functionalities uh, need to be quick in implementation. Uh, in the form of MVP. So your loyalty solution, when you think about it, it should be something that is rather simple, rather quick to implement, and something that you start building uh, on top of uh, once you have it going. So starting simple, selecting some of those tactics, selecting some of the functionalities that will deliver those, uh, those benefits and those functionalities to, uh, to your customers is key understanding which ones are crucial and which ones you can implement quickly is key, but don't, don't uh, wait uh, for your program to be fully fledged and having a comprehensive set of, set of strategies, tactics, and functionalities before launch. And I think, Jörn, you can say a few words about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, so first I would like to second what you just said is that you can really start anywhere and you can start small and grow it from there and successful loyalty programs have actually always grown over time they were never launched in one go um, we've seen even programs that start with a simple customer referral scheme and then they develop into a fully fledged loyalty program but i wanted to really focus a little bit more on that middle part the engage because the engage is something that we care about a lot at Antavo, and we have built a our principle of our platform is that you engage customers outside of the buying cycle and that actually has benefits in all of the other elements now maybe give an example on that um, so what we find is that the customers that you can engage with little games with little gamification mechanics as much as said before um, you know displaying status progress displaying achievements celebrating with surprise and delight rewards how you can um, how you can actually uh, give customers something that was unexpected and unreciprocated and unconditional. When you engage these customers, the first of all, it has a real um, positive benefit on the recruit element because those customers, we, which we engage, let's say, with an Instagram contest, they're giving you the extra reach. They're giving you the extra access to new customer segments. The customers that we have engaged and they've you know, grown their deeper emotional bond with us, they are the ones that are going to respond to our referral incentives. They are the ones that are going to share the brand on social media, and we see real good influence uh, on, the, on the recruitment numbers from that. Um, and also, 
when customers come into that recruitment funnel via you know, curated content via customer recommendations, they naturally already show a much better conversion uh, perspective. So those customers are converting to customers at a much higher rate, and so the cost of acquisition is a lot lower. Um, and then finally, those customers that are engaged are also easier to activate. <clears throat> so when you then deliver, let's say, bundle incentives to, ins to, to encourage cross-selling into new categories, when you give them incentives to try out new services, when you give them incentives to actually consume your content, the inspiration and guidance that we had in there, those customers are going to respond much stronger. And that actually then, again, leaves you to not have to do all the win-back activity that you have to do. So um, for us, the engage is really, really crucial. Um, good. So I'll... I'll take this into a slightly different dimension now, a slightly different area, which is talk about technology a little bit. And obviously we at Antabo are technology, but I don't want to go into deep technology tech topics today. What I wanted to focus on are, are really three messages. The first one is to make your loyalty program successful, your loyalty initiative successful, it's really important that you focus on that technology that drives the customer experience. So build onto a real good, insightful, solid, reliable foundation of unified data where you can build your single customer view. You'll have a loyalty engine, a modern loyalty engine, a best-in-class loyalty engine, and we'd like to obviously stress that that's important, that loyalty is delivered for a loyalty purpose and bespoke and is best-in-class. That loyalty engine can really supercharge your marketing automation infrastructure. So all the information that you collect in there, all those experiences and events, and all the incentives that you have at your disposal go into your overall marketing automation, um, You know where you decide which customer gets what message, which channel does it get delivered by, it goes um, uh, and chooses the right offers, et cetera. And that then delivers it into a really nice and engaging and easy to manage front end layer. So whether that's on mobile, whether that's on a POS, whether that's a tablet device that you give your store staff, whether it's your website, um, or whether it's actually installing a kiosk or some digital device into your stores where customers can engage with. If those three things are working in harmony and they're all feeding into the same data structure and they're fed by, <coughs> sorry, the same data structure, that's how you can get that engagement level that is really the key to driving that successful loyalty program. Obviously, don't forget the foundations, you know, scalability, security, reliability. Um, I didn't want to leave that out because we sometimes see if there are any issues there, then everything else you do is, is, is a way. But it's also really about the capabilities that you have um, on your technology, in your IT, but also in the execution, in, in your marketing. So agile development, rapid test execution, that's gonna help you to iterate quickly to learn and improve the program. And especially because we recommend to start small, you need to evolve. And that's really important for you to evolve. And then a predictive decisioning engine can be really powerful to deliver that personalized, that relevant experience that we, that we mentioned earlier as well. So that's what I'd like to say about technology without going into a real you know, um, discussion on the different modules and what they should do. Yes, and coming back to, to uh, I would say, the front-end perspective and and the commercial perspective, uh, what's really, really important and something that, that we really want to stress uh, today when talking to you is this, this big shift that is, on the one hand, driven by the strategies and tactics uh, that we have presented before, and the underlying advancements in technologies that, that supercharge uh, loyalty solutions, is that this allows for, a, I would say, a quite a significant shift in how we understand loyalty programs and the role a loyalty program uh, uh, plays within a retailer's, uh, retailer's strategy. Uh, something that we will we will talk about uh, in a minute, how this actually impacts and can become something that we call customer activation and engagement hubs. So shifting from traditionally understood loyalty programs that used to be generic, prevailingly point and card based, and this is a separate topic that we'll deep dive in a minute. Sometimes points work, sometimes they don't. Uh, but there is this big shift from generic point and card to personalized. Uh, mobile app, so using really the infrastructure that your customers, all the customers at the moment, uh, have in their pockets. Shift from limited functionalities 
with fairly complicated redemption rules. So historically, we've seen uh, players implementing loyalty programs with complicated, very difficult redemption rules in order not to give rewards, in order to postpone the rewarding maximally. But we see that this is this is really not working for for majority of retailers. Furthermore, uh, this actually makes your loyalty program uh, members churn instead of actually recommending it to, to new members. What, ha what happens now and what is the direction of development is merging multiple functionalities that are built on top of each other. So you start simple from, you know, from the perspective of inspiring customers, uh, adding, uh, adding an ad additional uh, uh, shopping channel or a transactional channel later on the program and then of course the social perspective of sharing recommending uh, from existing members to new potential to new potential customers and finally from the commercial perspective and from the headquarters perspective what we're seeing that historically loyalty programs used to be operated either within digital or within marketing as a fairly separated siloed commercial function what we're seeing right now is that this kind of customer activation and engagement hub within the organization becomes a center of excellence for all the commercial activities that you'll be doing because of the fact that this is where the best quality data about your customers is, uh, is in your organization. And because of the fact that you can use this data not only to activate your uh, members of your loyalty program or your loyalty scheme, but you can use look-alike anal analytics to, to really engage and create a higher effectiveness pricing and promotional process. Yeah, and um, just to add to that is this shift is not just there because you know we wanted to. It's not just there because technology allows us to do this. This is driven by what the customers are expecting and how customers are choosing and making purchasing decisions today. And this has gone far beyond a simple value for money equation. That's still going to be important, but customers increasingly are, are looking for things that are going beyond price and beyond the transaction. Um, especially newer generations are looking to build emotional connections with brands. They need they, they need to be treated like um, they are treated from people they know, from friends and family. So everything you always tell a customer, you, customers are expecting that you remember the conversations. Customers are looking for experiences that they can share rather than you know possessions. Customers are looking for time and convenience instead of obviously price all the time. So these are the, 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 the opportunities and customer attitudes that you'd exploit with a loyalty program that goes beyond um, you know, the, the generic that uh, Adam described. And um, you know, about the, the point on points, I'm going to spend 10 seconds on that because it's a little pet peeve uh, of mine. I think what we, when we talk about points-based program, we often mean the traditional earn and burn programs where everything is about spend and then everything is about discounts. Um, points as a mechanic, I don't think it's going to die out. Um, it's going to be you know, replaced sometimes, but um, it's the earn and burn thinking that it's all about the money that's going to be replaced going forward. Yes, and, and when we think about this new approach to where loyalty program or where your customer activation and engagement hub, as we like to call it, uh, lies within your commercial strategy and how it impacts uh, all the remaining levers that you have uh, with regards to, 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 to a retailer's uh, portfolio. First of all, we see huge impact on revenue management. Uh, so whenever we see a retailer deciding to really get into the, 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 the strategy of loyalizing, of working for, uh, on a dedicated loyalty, loyalty uh, uh, program or scheme, we see that having a huge impact on how they start running their traditional generic pricing and promotional, uh, promotional activities. This is because of that positive spillover to general revenue management. So this higher quality data that you can then feed into your pricing decisions, not only from the perspective of this portion of your customers within the program, but the generally uh, within your strategy. The same with promotions. So really understanding what is the optimal frequency and depth of promotions, not only within your loyalty program, but also from the perspective of uh, running lookalike campaigns, understanding understanding how you can feed that data, this additional layer of data that you get from your, your members 
to better manage your promotional activities. And then finally, from the perspective of stock management, which is, uh, which is quite interesting from our perspective, you can use your loyalty program really to, uh, to engage clients, uh, to, to, uh, to buy uh, products that you want, to, uh, you want to sell off. So you can give dedicated promotions, not necessarily targeted broadly, but you can do it in, sequ in sequences. So for example, starting a, a sales from, your, from the perspective of targeting your, your uh, loyalty program members, this gives them uh, a reward, which is which is a tangible reward of getting something earlier than other customers, but it gives you a flexibility to manage to manage your stock. From the perspective of store format, uh, everything that is associated with dedicated services, checkout options, uh, automated checkouts, self checkouts. Uh, that you can you can implement into an app-based loyalty program. On the one hand, uh, this makes the customer journey uh, much easier and smoother. And from the perspective of your store operations, make it makes it makes it uh, much easier for your for your uh, staff to manage to, to manage client flow. And then. Uh, we see that increasingly happening uh, across retail, uh, in-store mer merchandising options, dedicated shelves, dedicated inspiration way of uh, really building your shelves to really target and link this merchandising to, uh, to campaigns that you're running within your loyalty program. So again, linking the physical in your store with what is in the app and what is in the digital. This makes, again, I would say, engagement much higher from the perspective of members, but makes recruitment much easier because it activates your other customers to really get interested uh, uh, from the perspective of what they're seeing uh, in the stores. Yeah, um, the next point here, obviously, impact on communication. We already touched on it before, so I want to keep it short. Um, what's really important here, it gives you not just fully controlled touch point, but it gives you really positive and relevant touch points because everything that is communicated within the context of a loyalty initiative carries additional rewards, carries additional value, and it's very transactional and it's expected, not disruptive. Um, the second point really is about the improvement in targeting, and that comes from having that loyalty data, the behavioral data, because now you can connect all your customer touch points and understand them in a much more comprehensive way. That is that improvement in targeting that you can apply across your whole communication infrastructure, not just the loyalty. And then finally, it's a real great space for testing and early adoption. In testing-wise, you know, um, you have a subsegment. You have a subsegment of really engaged people, which means you can run smaller tests because you're going to get bigger response rates, so you can get quicker results out there. Now you have to be aware that there's a little bias in your membership there, but still, it's a great uh, opportunity to test before you roll out. And that testing and that early adoption actually reaches over into the service delivery as well here. Because if you are in reimagining kind of the digital delivery of services in the post-COVID era, and if you're trying to shift your transaction support um, to customer support, to consultative sales in also digital channels, if that's how your store is going to be reinvented, the loyalty program gives you the two angles to, to support that strategy shift. The one is you can incentivize early adoption of these services. So getting people to try this out with loyalty incentives, great way to get things started. But also of, of, of often these new services have some you know, scale problems. You can't deliver that super dedicated service to everybody. So managing demand, managing access to these services through the means of loyalty programs, either through a tier system or by having to buy access to these things, can also help you manage that service delivery until you're confident enough to roll it out at scale. All right. So now moving to the um, very practical part. Uh, what I wanted to highlight there is there's a set of uh, extremely important measures which actually define whether the program is meant to be successful or will it be challenged by the market. And uh, let us go with some practical examples one by one. There, there, there's a couple of that rules. And the first point is care of awareness. It, it might sound obvious. However, in reality, we frequently face this, uh, this challenge. It's a question whether the customers really know 
that the program exists or the activation platform exists? Do they know what's, what are the benefits? Can it be easily explained? And can it, is it well understood? And we've seen a number of uh, programs which were very nicely designed in terms of design, in terms of the mechanics, but there was just not enough work in terms of awareness, which was building the, um, the recruitment of the products, which is also then leading to um, specifics, anomalies when you're analyzing the data. To give you one example, we worked with a retailer uh, that cash personnel was not able to uh, explain what the program is for, and what are the benefits. Therefore, people with slower, smaller purchasing baskets were never using that any type of uh, identification because it wasn't pushed by the uh, um, by the people at the cashiers. Then, as a result, the company was sure that the people using the loyalty platform are having way way higher um, transactions than everybody else, and was investing more and more and more. In reality, it appeared that simply nobody was uh, caring to show the uh, identification or to identify himself whenever there was a smaller transaction. So that was basing on false assumption, again, linked with awareness, not only of the customers, uh, not only of the benefits, but also of the internal staff, which we call it's extremely um, important. Uh, building on what Jorn and Adam were mentioning, start simple. It's crucial for customers to understand the rules. You don't have to have everything in place. It is crucial to get the customer base, to, to enlarge that, that one, and to work with customers to develop the program as they go and analyze their behaviors, uh, and analyze their behaviors while developing the new and new elements. So very often we see that the program starts basics, basic, and then after some time, it's only starting to consider whether there should be any tiers developed or not, what are the most functioning uh, challenges for uh, for customers. Why? Because you have to build data and you have to build uh, a customer mass who are uh, who are enrolled. Uh, the point: understand your customer client and develop the program as you go. It's constant understanding of what people are doing, mostly in terms of behavior. How frequent they are coming? Are they being triggered by specific messages? Do they enjoy? Do they are they sending any feedback? Do we see utilization of fun factors? or any type of uh, identification uh, or gamification inside of the program. That's the best guide for the, for the program itself. With one key message here, it means once the program is developed and started, it's not done. It's the beginning of the journey. It's important milestone, but it's just beginning of the journey of further development, introduction of new features, et cetera, et cetera. And crucial point is to base the logic of the program on existing habits. So if we see that customers are behaving in a specific way and specific manner, we cannot incentivize to do them something completely else. What can we, what can we be asking them in a targeted way is to actually start, um, uh, start uh, stretching their behaviors a little bit, get something more, try to work with your basket a little bit more, come visit more often, Use it. The use the, the the solution. Identify yourself. I don't know. Enable geolocation. Start sharing something on the social media. So as we are building the habits, we have to also develop them as they go, a little step by step. Um, all right. Uh, so a couple of examples, and then moving uh, on delivering the promises to make it happen. Uh, the key question always says, should it be frequency-based or value-based, right? So th that's a question you have to ask yourself. What is the most relevant point for you? And at this moment, what we would understand that frequency is uh, uh, becoming the crucial element, but understand what is developing the habit and how they are uh, how they are evolving. Conscious rewarding. I mean, once you give any type of privilege, once you give any type of reward and once you, you grant it, it's not easy to take it back. So we've seen a number of programs which were building their tiering or type of rewards that they were offering based on um, discounts, minus three, minus five, minus seven percent, depending on the tier. But that's a vicious cycle and that's, that's, a, uh, that's a honey trap because they, people start to enjoy it. But in the end, they always take that discount for, uh, for granted 
and they just simply discount everything. It's not influencing their behavior. It's just saving money in their, uh, in their pockets. And uh, uh, we've seen a number of that activities, for example, in Russia, where a uh, major part of the programs are solely based on the, on the discount. It's, it's been a trap that a lot of companies are having serious challenging in, um, in escaping uh, from. Uh, the point about yeah. redemption, uh, in many business cases for the loyalty programs, which we've seen it as, yes, but let's calculate, and of course that's the important part, how many customers are actually going to accrue the points, but they're not going to redeem them. And that's that, that, that's a little bit the road to nowhere. Why? Because if you want to develop habits, if you want to engage your customers, you have to incentivize the redemption uh, because it also builds the satisfaction and gives a reason to try. Another example, we've seen a number of um, petrol uh, vendors, so gas stations, having the programs when you collect forever to buy potential vacuum cleaner, but everybody's collecting, they're never getting to, uh, to that point. So actually they don't see the value. It's becoming more of a habit than any value. So there's not much steering of the, um, of the customer behavior. If you make them redeem, you make them happy. And as Joran and Adam were raising uh, a few slides earlier, the topic of uh, being smart in terms of selecting the rewards, what we've seen while working with every single program is that uh, there's a very different different perception of the perceived value or ratio between the perceived value. So how much uh, customers are uh, valuing the, the price that they're getting and the real costs. So the crucial point here is uh, to to understand how to how to redeem, and what we see is that major part of the ROI in any programs comes actually from the customers who redeem. So make sure that they redeem because then they become the best ambassadors of um, of your challenge. And last but not least, but but something that we we've observed is becoming a, uh, that, that's a thing which is becoming crucial in the modern digital era. It's fun factors and gamification. Gamification, not only in terms of competing with the others, because that's that's frequently something which customers don't enjoy that much, but gamification versus oneself. So getting badges, getting extra discounts, taking part in a competition, uh, playing in a game or um, in other programs when you are, I don't know, having the little piggies with collecting coins, but when you shake the phone, for example, it's making, uh, making sounds or when you uh, when you twist the telephone, then the stars collected to the mug they are pouring out, or anything like that. It's a it's a thing that we always work closely while working with the UX designers. However, uh, it's very but frequently undervalued by the business team. However, in the end, that's what's becoming the one of the success factors. So at some point, think about your program and your platform or the application as the famous toy Tamagotchi of which you have to take care, which you have to feed, and then it's giving you um, a lot of um, a lot of joy. Yeah, it's... Um, and then concluding on that, what uh, we want... Yeah, you want to please go on? Yeah, just a quick one. I know we're a bit uh, running behind on time. Um, just wanted to really stress the point that redemption is where the value is coming from. And if you feel like you need to constrain redemption, the best way to limit redemption is to stop the program. So if you're at that point, like, what's the point of running it? Um, uh, and if this really is such a financial issue, then it is coming back to redesigning the rewards in such a way that you can manage the cost on it. And it actually is value generating. Every single redemption event should generate value for you. Um, so work on the conscious, work on the, on the type of offers you're giving. We have a client in, in Italy, the, the second most popular reward that they have in their catalog is actually spending points to get access to get the right to buy a special sneaker when it's launched. So the cost is absolutely zero. It's a fear of missing out um, and points are getting spent. It's the second most popular reward. And then that's one of the reasons for success in this program. So um, it's something to really keep in mind. Yeah, a couple of other examples. You would be surprised how many people prefer while buying hamburger the extra jalapeno than actually eat the extra um, extra sandwich because that's something that they like and the cost is like 15 times uh, different. Any access to exclusivity, any access to pre-bookings or anything like that um, is becoming crucial. 
one of the great examples we've seen, again, coming from the, the restaurant industry, if you were participating, uh, there was a lot of customers who were gamers. So in the online games like World of Tanks, etc., you would be able to get a, a custom-made skin for your for your tank. Uh, so something fully virtual, however, extremely extremely valued by the by the customers. So again, thing like Tamagotchi, like a, a mobile game uh, monetizing customers. And the, the, to conclude a little bit here, uh, why we believe the time to act is now, or the time to act was actually yesterday. Uh, the customers are extremely open to apps, to loyalty programs, to any type of um, digital uh, digital contact interaction with the brand. It's the, the the COVID is sending a change signal, as we call it, in terms of direct interactions of brands, but also direct interactions of of, cust uh, of, of retailers without the need actually of uh, of moving from the comfort of mobile or computer. There is a huge acceptance of direct communication channels, and it has increased basing on the uh, formula that it's something which is suiting my needs and that it's getting personalized. And then the personalization activations are related, as we described, to the life cycle of the customers, and they're crucial in the way of winning in the war on traffic. We have to start with getting back the customers which were gone, so the win-back strategies, re-enroll them, re-engage them, try to get as many as potential of the customers which we gained during that, that time. So every single stage of the lifetime should be should be affected. And last but not least, technology is here and it's ready to enable the, the, the transformation. So there are already mature and, and developed solutions made rather easy for retailers to come up with this type of uh, solution. Therefore, we see the increasing number of uh, companies considering the activity in that uh, area or what is becoming also very frequent, redesigning the offerings that they have. So making the programs more appealing and actually working with the customers. Uh, what we've seen that the companies who decide not to work with the area of personalization, getting closer with the customers and using the, the platforms, there's a, the, the simple risk of knowing less about the customers and losing the set of valuable insights which are crucial in rapidly evolving environment. It's, it's crucial to understand who's doing what and why, and uh, how we can win react, what is working for that um, for that customer to win them back and make them shop with us uh, again. Uh, there's a bigger reliance on the effect, less effective sales channels. So still higher utilization of ATL, mass actions, TV costly, and frequently um, affecting in effective in a number of markets. But then again, huge shifts and the more and more of the uh, age groups of the customers are not using that communication channels. Plus, uh, there's the lower um, effectiveness of the uh, mass-oriented um, commercial, um, commercial levers. We understand uh, that we are just about the time. But uh, if there's any more questions, we have some more. We'll probably try to answer one of our two. For the other ones, we would be trying to get back for you. But like, if you'd like to have questions asked, we strongly encourage to do it. If not, Adam Joren, which one of you would like to take the, the first question that we have? Um, I have a question here. Um, it's the question about um, long-term loyalty with the promise of a reward. Uh, or a short, powerful loyalty campaign with free instant win or short-term redemption, uh, what will win in the post-pandemic world? So it's about like short instance versus more the long vision on it. Um, you know, looking at that, I'm not sure it's one or the other. Uh, I, I think right now, uh, free instant wins or short-term redemption, as we said before, redemption is really the key to unlocking value. So we would always have elements of short-term redemption and free instant and surprise wins or delights uh, rewards in a loyalty campaign. But if you're running that exclusively, it's going to be really hard to maintain that level of engagement, to maintain that freshness. And uh, you don't want to be a retailer who gets into the business of mobile gaming. So I think it's important that you give those customers that you draw in with these very quick incentives and put them on the journey of that long-term behavioral emotional loyalty by having you know tier progression, by having long-term really 
attractive incentives in play, but by really making it continuously fun and delivering the service in a special, innovative way so that you can connect with your customers on a value level and not just on a, you know, gimmick, I would say, level. Yes, and, and so I have a question here about how the stars will look like in the future. So how the stars will change. Uh, will there be more dark stars fulfillment for e-commerce uh, or will they turn into, into showrooms? Uh, it really depends, so to answer this question, on, on the industry. But we, we assume that the transactional parts and the transactional side of stores is never going to disappear, especially when we talk about large industries within retail, such as grocery, uh, such as mass, mass fashion, so on and so forth. But what we strongly believe in is that uh, engagement and, and really broadening loyalty, loyalty uh, uh, developed solutions can really transform the, the, the way the store is operating. So definitely it will remain a transactional point for, for customers who are not within the loyalty scheme. However, it may become much more optimized towards quick, uh, I'll say more, more, uh, more, more seamless uh, visits uh, for customers who are inside of the scheme. So any types of solution of self-checkout powered by, by uh, mobile apps can really make the life of your customers much easier inside of your store uh, and make uh, uh, your store staff also uh, much, more, much more focused on consultative sales and serving clients who are not inside of the, lo uh, inside of the loyalty program and maybe making them uh, having more time to really engage with those customers to recruit them into the loyalty program. Yes, thanks. Thanks for that, Jordan Adam. So, what we would say because we we understand that we started a few minutes later. So, uh, what we would say with the other remaining questions, we'll be trying to get back to you directly with the um, with the answers. Uh, so, from our perspective, I wanted to thank you very much for this um, joint meeting for an hour spent together. I hope it's been inspirational and. Uh, even if you're thinking about the starting of a loyalty program or you already have one, um, it's a moment of reflection to ask uh, oneself a couple of questions. How am I ranking my, uh, my solution and the thing we're offering uh, against the, the, the practices that we were trying to, um, to present? And we keep the, the fingers crossed for any developments that uh, you would be pursuing within the next days. Uh, because we truly believe that actually the loyalty programs are becoming one of the core solutions for the post-COVID era for bigger and better interaction with the customer and, and simply winning on the phenomenon which we call the, the world traffic. So if there's any questions, doubts or requests coming, uh, we'd be very happy to also share the material. Uh, please contact any of us listed here and uh, we'll try to do our best then. Yes, thank you very much for your time. I hope it was interesting and uh, you have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.